Good morning everyone and welcome to the next video in the information security space. This video is going to deal with computer security. So what are we going to cover in this video? We are going to start with what exactly is computer security? What are the types of attacks that are possible on computers? What is it that we want to secure when we say we want a computer to be secured properly? Why do we get attacked in the first place and how to secure a computer? So let's start with the first topic. What is computer security? Computer security is the protection of computer systems and information from harm, theft and unauthorized device. So if you have a computer and you've got some information on it, the objective of that entire exercise is that you're going to try to protect the information and the system from any harm from external hackers or internal hackers. So in this scenario, Dinah is trying to send information to her manager, but the information is intercepted by the hacker and and the hacker gets their hand on uh, some sensitive information that Dinah is trying to send. Here in this case, it's a password. Now, since the hacker has the password to Dinah's laptop, the hacker can then try to get access and then steal data from Dinah. Let's look at the type of attacks on information security or computers. The first one is a denial of service or a DOS attack. In a DOS attack, the attacker normally tries to consume the bandwidth or the resources that are available for the server that is deploying the application or that is allowing those resources to be given out to the users. And once the hacker has restricted those resources or has consumed those resources, there wouldn't be any sufficient resources for end users or legitimate users to consume, thus denying them the legitimate service and hence being called a denial of service attack. Here in this case, there is a bot master, there are various bots and these bots would then generate traffic or malware and then try to attack the victims. A bot is nothing but a software that can be installed on a victim's machine uh, using which the attacker can then remotely send uh, commands to the bot and the bot will then create that traffic to attack the victim. So here in this case the bot is nothing but that software that has been installed on the victim's machine that allows the bot master or the hacker in this case to remotely send commands to the bot to do appropriate actions. The next attack we are going to talk about is malwares. Malwares are nothing but malicious softwares that pose as legitimate softwares but will have a virus, trojan or a worm embedded within it, right? It could also be a keylogger. A keylogger is nothing but another software that is created to catch all the keystrokes that the user is making, create a copy of it and store it and send it back to the hacker. So whatever the user is typing, it will now be known to the hacker. It could be bank details, passwords, any personal information that the user might want to keep secret. We are going to look at three different demos here. This demo is just to showcase a couple of things. Uh, we are going to look at a keylogger, how a keylogger works, this virtual machine here, and I've already downloaded a keylogger and installed it. The idea of this demo is to showcase how a keylogger functions, right? So you can see online uh, on the screen, we are using a free keylogger.en.softonic.com. We are on this site and you can download the free keylogger right from here. What I've done using my demos is that I've always have a keylogger running in the background to capture all the keystrokes that I've been doing whenever I'm doing any demos. So this keylogger here can actually be hidden in the taskbar, but for our demo purposes, I've kept it visible. When you click on it, it will open up and give you a basic screen where you can start navigating about the keylogger. Now you can see that on 8th, which is today, it already shows some keystrokes, applications, and some visited websites. As you can see, already been browsing using the browser over here, and which has been recorded by the keylogger in the background. And just to give you an example, if I click on this file, you will see all the keystrokes that I have been doing so far. And you can see I've gone to this, I've opened up my Mozilla Firefox, I've typed in a key search keyword of free keylogger, then I've gone onto the website how secure my, is my password.net, in which I may have tried out a few passwords myself, and then I've gone and, uh, and copy pasted this URL into the a browser window and you can see all of this has been recorded and just to emphasize on that let's go on to another website and let's say let's go to facebook.com I'm not actually going to log in. I'm just going to type in a random username. So someone at simplylearn.com and a password like ASD at the rate one, two, three, four. And I'm going to try to log in. Obviously the login is going to fail because this account doesn't exist, but we want to see what happens in the background when the keylogger picks up the keystrokes that we have typed. 
So let's open up the key logger again and go and see what is there in the keystrokes and clipboard. And you can see over here that we typed in facebook.com enter and then we did not type in the username. That's the difference here. We selected it from a drop down. So a keystroke logger or key logger has not been able to capture that input. A key logger in its essence is only records something that has been typed in by the user real time. Since we did not type in the username, it did not record that username, but we typed in the password and you can see the password over here ASD at the rate 1234. And this is how a keylogger works. It only captures the keystrokes that have been typed in real time. So if we use this exercise on our victims and they're just using drop down menus at that point in time, none of the data is going to be recorded. For that activity, you would need something which is known as spyware, which would capture screen, which would capture all of this information that is going on. Now, apart from just logging keystrokes, what this software also does is it also has a list of used applications. So you can see all the applications that have uh, booted up along with the operating system and the ones that have started up after the operating system has booted. It also has a list of the visited websites. So you can see these are the websites that we have been visiting and uh, they have been listed right here. The last one being Facebook, login or sign up, right? So this can store history for a uh, really long time. If I go back in time and if I look at some of the demos that I've been looking at, so on 14th of September, these were the keystrokes that I utilized when I was doing some trainings or while I was providing some demos on other topics. So a keystroke uh, or a keylogger will store all that information and keep on rec uh, recording it till you actually delete that data or you can uh, you can reset the keylogger. You can also set up the keylogger to send an email to you on a daily as a daily report to a particular email address that you have sent. So as long as it detects the internet connectivity, this keylogger will send you, send you an email to the email address that you have specified uh, with all the keystrokes that it has logged. Now this is the free version. There's again a paid version for it. So you can go and visit this site and see how this keylogger functions. If I press on the X button over here, it will ask me if I want this to be hidden in the system tray. If I click on yes, it only using this shortcut will I be able to invoke this screen. So just for demo purposes, I do not want this to be hidden. So I'm going to click on no and you can see that the keylogger is still visible over here. So that was the first demo that we are seeing. Viruses, as we all know, are destructive programs that uh, once executed would destroy data or harm the hard disk or the partition tables. Worms, on the other hand, uh, would be softwares that would be more of a nuisance value where they're going to replicate themselves in such a way that they would consume the resources of a, com a computer, thus crashing the computer and then requiring a reboot. A Trojan horse is another software that will allow a backdoor entry or a covert channel to the hack hacker where the hacker in this case would then be able to gain access to the victim's machine through the covert channel or the backdoor without the knowledge and the authorization of the user themselves. The next attack, man in the middle. So if you've been looking at the types of attacks that we've been talking about, the denial of service attack was where we're consuming the resources of the system in such a way that they are no longer available for legitimate users. Malwares, on the other hand, would be softwares that would either destroy data or give a backdoor entry to the victim's machines for the hacker. So a man in the middle attack is nothing but a network based attack where the hacker is going to try to intercept the communication or the data flow between the victim and the endpoint. And thus, when they grab these informations, they would then have captured some data that they wouldn't, uh, they weren't supposed to get in the first place. So here in this example, uh, here, suppose you're in trouble and you need money right now and you call your friend and ask for money. So here the person is calling John, uh, telling John that they're in trouble and they're asking for John to give their credit card number over the phone. Now this is a legitimate transaction. The friend is actually calling John and asking for some help. However, when John is providing that help over the phone with the credit card numbers, maybe the CVV number and all of that, and then the OTP at the end of it, at the same time, there could be a hacker doing a man in the middle attack where they could be eavesdropping on whatever uh, is being said or whatever data is being transferred. And once they capture this confidential data, they can then misuse that data to their own gains. The next attack is phishing. Phishing is a very common attack in today's world. It is where the attacker say, sends a bait often in the form of an email with a hyperlink in it uh, to encourage people to click on it 
thus getting redirected to a malicious server that the hacker is hosting and then end up giving out confidential information. Now, obviously the requirement here is that the email that is being sent out by the attacker needs to look very legitimate and needs to uh, look genuine to the victim for them to go ahead and click on the link and provide that data. So here the example is where the email has been received. Dear customer, your account is going to expire today. To keep your account activated, please click on the link here and proceed with the verification process. Now here the link that we see activate.com would be a hyperlink which is going to mask the actual URL where the uh, link is going to redirect us. Right here, the attack is on the gullibility of the customer where they would fear that the account would be deactivated and to prevent that they would press this email, click on the link and then provide the information thinking that they're just reactivating their account, but they're actually leaking their own information to the attacker. So the first thing you have to understand is banks or any organization are no, not going to send you any emails with a link in it asking you to re, uh, reactivate or anything like that. In fact, banks proactively tell us that they're uh, not going to give, uh, call us and ask for any information. In fact, they would want us to call them on their registered number or the helpline number that they have declared on their website or on the cards that we possess. The next attack we are going to talk about is eavesdropping. Eavesdropping is where you observe the traffic on your system and the work that you're doing on your system. For example, email traffic or uh, the website that you're visiting or what you're downloading. So eavesdropping would essentially be uh, the sniffing attacks on networks where you're going to sniff data packets and you're going to try to observe uh, the ongoings or the data that is flowing between endpoints, between servers, and you're just going to try to ob observe it. The next attack is SQL injection or SQL injection. SQL stands for structured query language, which is the language that is used by an application to interact with the database and the database to give that information back to the application, right? So an SQL injection attack is where an attacker can inject a malicious input in that SQL query that is being created by the application, which if executed by the database is going to leak confidential data, especially uh, they're going to leak data that these users were not authorized to access in the first place. So uh, the next attack would be a password attack. As the name suggests, this attack is used to crack or get the password for user's account. Or uh, when we say crack passwords, this is basically where somebody is trying to brute force or they're trying to guess the password and they're going to break the password, thus getting access to your accounts. There are five different ways passwords can be cracked. The first one is a dictionary attack where we use every password that is possible through the dictionary. Now this is the use of an actual dictionary. And that's one of the reasons when we try to create passwords, we are advised not to create passwords based on dictionary words because these are easily guessable and there are lists already out there that contain all of these words. There's a tool that you can utilize and that tool will then parse through each and every word that is in the dictionary file and then compare it to a possible password. If one of the words matches, the password has then be compromised. So if you are observing a little bit higher security where we have created a password that is not based on a dictionary word, then we want to look at other attacks like brute force. It is a trial and error method. So basically what we do is we identify how the passwords were created. For example, in today's world, the policies would be to consume in a password any, uh, any of the alphabet characters A through Z, uppercase or lowercase zero through nine and then special characters and then we want to randomize the uh, usage of these characters so that they are not easily guessable but a brute force attack at the same time would then try every permutation and combination there is possible in the entire character set and then try to figure out the password now this takes a really long time and does take a lot of compute and storage power and that's where the botnet example comes in comes back in the one that we saw earlier which was used for dos attack but similarly if i have infected multiple computers like this i can then distribute this attack onto all those computers and use the entire compute power that is available to shorten the time that is required to uh, crack the password. Now, based uh, this is 100% successful given the time that it may take. So if the time that is going to take is going to be 100 years, the attack becomes unsuccessful because during that period, uh, the password is most likely to be changed, the technology is going to be changed and so on and so forth. So if the password is easily guessable, this can be a very easy attack to perform. Then a key logger, which is a similar attack to what we have seen. So a key logger, as discussed earlier, is nothing but a software that once installed on your machine would grab each and every keystroke that the user has made and store it in a file 
which the hacker can later on access. So whatever you have been typing, passwords, credit card information or anything else, all of those would be recorded and stored in a file and that's one of the best way a password can be compromised. Then shoulder surfing. This is a physical attack rather than being a technical one. Uh, here you need to be physically be present when the user is typing in their password and you actually look over their shoulder to see what they are typing and try to figure out what the password is. If they are quick typers, it is going to be a little bit more difficult. If they are slow typers, it's going to be that much more easy. And the last one is called a rainbow table. Now, passwords, when applications store them, are stored in hash format. Hash is nothing but a one-way signature that is created of the password file, of the word that is used for the password, and it is based on an algorithm. So, the input could be of variable length. For example, a password could be 7 to 14 characters, but the output of a hash value would be fixed based on the algorithm that you're consuming. So, most common algorithms in today's world that we utilize are SHA, Secure Hashing Algorithms. Before that, we used MD5 or message digest so all of these convert the passwords from plain text into a hash value and store it into a database so if you actually attack that database to grab a password you're going to get the hash value not the password in clear text and thus in that scenario comes the rainbow table to the rescue a rainbow table is nothing but a file that will have the list of all possible passwords along with their hash values in the required format so if you remember the dictionary attack, the dictionary attack was nothing but a list of words based on the dictionary that were stored in a file and then the software was just trying each and every word against a possible password. Here, we do not have the word but we have the hash value. So, to reverse engineer hash value, what we created is, we created a rainbow table where there would be a list of all the possible passwords and their corresponding hash values. So, we then compare the hash value that we have captured and then search for that hash value in the file that we have created. The hash value that matches the corresponding word to it is the password in clear text. So these are the five types of password attacks. Then moving on to social engineering. This is something very common in today's world. This is basically where the prey is the human itself. And the reason social engineering attacks are very successful is because of the gullibility factor that a human has. For example, human has something called emotions that a machine wouldn't. You could plead with a human for a password to be reset by gaining sympathy or empathy. But try doing that with a machine, those attacks are going to fail. Social engineering attacks are not only limited to those, but we can talk about phishing. Phishing is also a part of social engineering attack where the gullibility of the user to click on that link is being exploited. In this scenario here, this is Clark. He is calling from the ID security team. That means that he is impersonating probably and then telling the victim that the system has been compromised. Please share the password with me. The victim on the other hand thinks that the person is trying to help her. She probably doesn't verify that person, trust that person and then provides the password over the phone. Now here, it is fear that is being exploited because the password being compromised would uh, clearly upset the end user for loss of data or for the computer revealing out confidential information. Thus, here she is trusting the IT uh, security team for the password to be uh, reset and given back to her. Now, let's talk about what to secure. When we talk about security, we talk about the CIA triad. CIA, not the agency, but CIA stands for Confidentiality, Integrity and Availability. And this is the basis of which your security stands. So any course, any training that you go through will always talk about confidentiality, integrity and availability. And this is the triangle or the triad that we're talking about. So when we talk about CIA and we talk about confidentiality, confidentiality is the aspect where we want to keep the data secret based on the value of the data to us. For example, there would be data that is publicly being displayed. For example, the data that we publish on our website, which when a user goes on is clearly visible over there. But there would be some data that the company needs to keep private or within themselves so that the data would have proprietary value to that organization and that could be sold as a business. Even within an organization, when you're talking about data, there would be classification levels, there would be data that would be made available depending on the hierarchy and the roles of people within that organization. So when we use those access control lists and we try to keep data available only to those authorized users when they want it, that's what confidentiality is. 
identifying and classifying that data in such a way that the data is available only to authorized users as and when they want it. Now, integrity is the part where we want to keep the data trustworthy. Even if somebody is able to access it or allowed to access it, they should not in an unauthorized or an unintentional manner, manner be able to change that data without it being audited. Uh, there would be mistakes that a person commits at some point in time where those mistakes also need to be weeded out because mistakes can basically alter the data in such a way where it wouldn't, it would stop making sense. So the integrity part is where we are trusting the data or we are ensuring that the trustworthiness of the data is intact so that consumers, uh, when they uh, connect to that data, they can rest assured that the data is valuable and is correct at its point in time. The availability part is where keeping the data confidential and its integrity intact, we still need to ensure that the data is available to all authorized users as and when they need it. So this is the three aspects that you're going to use. Confidentiality, the first defense for confidentiality is using proper access control list. So we decide who's allowed to access the data and who's not allowed to access that data. Once we have created the authorization, we want integrity verification mechanisms, for example, hashing. So we, uh, we have some data stored, we create hash values of that data and we store them in a secret file. We keep on taking the hash value of those data to see the match. So if the hash value that we have taken now matches the ha hash value that we had taken earlier, the data is still intact, it has not been modified. But if the data gets modified, even by a single character, the entire hash value changes. So if the hash value of the current data does not match the hash value of the, of the data that was taken before, then the integrity is no longer there. Now, integrity verification cannot be done on files that keep on changing often. Normally, we will use C uh, system critical files or some uh, very secret files that remain static and do not change often. Only then uh, can we take hash values and then we can compare them uh, properly to see if uh, they have been modified or not. The availability part is creating redundancy. Uh, the infrastructure in such a way that uh, even if there is a small failure, we can absorb the failure, we can still move on and still that data can be made available to the end user. Motives behind this attack. Let's discuss motives behind these attacks. So, uh, the first motive of any attacker, uh, especially when you have discussed denial of service or distributed of, uh, denial of service, would be to disrupt business continuity. The business, if discontinued or if there's an interruption in the continuity of a business, would cause great harm to the organization. Uh, let's say in lost uh, profits, lost businesses, lost revenues, uh, loss of goodwill, uh, service level agreements not being adhered to, which would cause penalties to be paid to the customers and the clients, and so on and so forth. Apart from that, information theft and manipulating data, hackers normally would steal information from organizations and then would try to resell them on the black market or to competitors so that they can make a uh, quick buck. Creating fear and chaos by disrupting critical infrastructure. This is where terrorist uh, hackers could attack organizations or could attack governments, this uh, crippling uh, some of the services that they provide to the nation or to some particular areas, thus creating fear and panic amongst its citizens and thus harming the nation as a whole. Financial loss to the target, we have all talked about uh, banks getting hacked, money being stolen from their individuals getting compromised by phishing attacks and uh, losing uh, their life savings. Similarly, organizations can also lose a lot of money if they get hacked, especially with the new uh, laws in the market where they may have to pay penalties not only to the customers but to governments for failing to protect particular data. Achieving states' military objectives. Uh, countries keep on spying on each other. We have heard a lot of news in the recent world where uh, a specific country like Russia was uh, supposedly involved in the US election and so on and so forth. So uh, some of these attacks could really uh, happen in the uh, world. In fact, if you take into consideration uh, Iran and the nuclear strategy that they had created and what uh, flames and Stuxnet created as a havoc as far as uh, Iran's nuclear uh, reactor was concerned. Demanding ransom, uh, this is a, a very recent ca case in 2017 where WannaCry was released to the world and it infected a lot of computers costing the world around $4 billion in losses. Damaging reputation of the target, loss of goodwill. Uh, you wouldn't want to trust a business who gets hacked, right? So, uh, I mean, the thought process is if you cannot secure yourself, how would we expect you to secure critical data or sensitive data of your customers? 
and then propagating religious or political beliefs. Uh, we have organizations like ISIS who have a lot of propaganda online, a lot of videos, audios where they keep on targeting uh, people who are susceptible to these kind of videos and try to recruit them for their own for their own causes. So these are some of the motives behind these attacks. A motive could be anything. For example, a hacker could just be doing it for fun. Maybe somebody is just trying to hone their skills or learn new skills and uh, they just uh, try to try it out against a particular victim without the victim in, even being realizing it or the hacker actually having nothing against that victim. So a motive could be anything and everything that you can think up of, anything that would encourage a hacker to attack a particular organization or any organization at random. Now let's talk about how to secure a computer. Now there are multiple ways of securing computers. See, these are some of the basic ways. We are not going into advanced ways. We are still not talking about data centers. Uh, we are looking at end users. We are looking at talking and uh, talking about securing computers. So the first and the foremost is a two-way authentication mechanism. Most of us use that on a regular basis. We have secured our Gmail and Facebook accounts with two-way authentication, where we use usernames and passwords and then an OTP or a one-time password is texted to us or sent to a particular email address which we then have to input to then get access to the required resources. Securing passwords, we also have been told quite a lot number of times that passwords need to be secure which means that they should not be easy to guess, they should not be based on names, they should not be something dear to us, shouldn't be a reverse of a mobile number or a combination of date of birth and the mobile number. Basically, a password should be randomized, should be uh, of a length of not less than eight characters. 26 characters is supported, so it depends how much you want to secure your password with. Again, there are so many passwords to remember. That's where we actually start lacking in our password creation skills, where we use a same password for multiple accounts or then create a password that we can remember easily and then use those passwords. But in a sense, a password should be randomized, should not be created on anybody's name, anybody's likeliness, should not be dictionary based, but should be combination of uppercase and lowercase A through Z, zero through nine special characters, and it should be randomized. The string not should not be less than eight characters, can go up to 26 characters maximum. Regular updates, uh, this is very important. When we use softwares and we are especially re uh, relying on third party softwares, for example, operating systems, either we are using Linux, Microsoft or Mac, there will be flaws and vulnerabilities that would be identified in any of the operating systems on a regular basis. And that is why when we purchase a license, we get free updates for life of that operating system as individuals. It is important that we keep on installing these updates. These updates may not only be functional in nature, but could also be security updates. For example, Microsoft releases security updates every second Tuesday of every month. These security updates are collected together. These basically are patches that have been created to patch the most uh, critical vulnerabilities, the most common vulnerabilities that have been identified not only by Microsoft, but have been reported to them by third party organizations and individuals as well. And here I'm just saying Microsoft, it could be anything. You could be using a third party application, uh, which you have downloaded and installed. You need to keep on updating it. It could be as simple as uh, management softwares or maintenance softwares that you have installed on your machines. Microsoft Office, if you will, any software once installed needs to be maintained its patches to be identified and installed on a regular basis so that the most common known vulnerabilities on those applications would be plugged in thus re reducing your risk of getting hacked by an existing vulnerability antiviruses in today's world when we spend so much time on the internet we interact with so many people uh, we send and receive emails with attachments and we download a lot of data of the internet. Now, an antivirus is there to help us to identify whether any of these files that we are uploading, downloading, receiving via attachments could be malicious or could have a Trojan or a virus in it. So the antivirus job is to scan these files and warn us if there is anything malicious about that file. Then firewalls. Now, what is the difference between an antivirus and a firewall? An antivirus scans for files and malicious scripts or data within those files. Firewall is a software or a hardware that will allow or disallow certain protocols or certain connections from happening. So a firewall is configured 
in such a way where you allow certain protocols to work, certain ports to be opened, certain services to be functional. If a firewall is configured to block a particular service, any incoming or outgoing connection, as the rule may be, will be blocked by the firewall, thus safeguarding the end user from that kind of a connection. Phishing. Phishing attacks are very common nowadays. There are a lot of anti-phishing toolbars available on the internet. I personally use Netcraft. Uh, these anti-phishing toolbars basically look at the sites that we visit on a regular basis and then give us a risk rating of whether the site is genuine or is a probable fake site. On a regular basis, we also receive emails from unknown sources about lotteries that we have won or a Nigerian prince who has left a few billion dollars and uh, we receive SMS on our mobile phones as well. So we need to first verify the authenticity of these emails to understand whether these are genuine emails or fake mails. How to do that? We'll be looking at that in a future video of how to identify phishing mail and how to identify whether the mail is genuine or not. Cryptography encryption. Try to encrypt as much data as possible. But be aware that with encryption, you would be consuming a little bit more compute power, maybe a little bit more network bandwidth and a little bit more storage. So there has to be a fine balance of how much encryption we want to use compared to how much compute and how much capacity that we have. But in today's world, with the latest laptops having at least 8 GB RAM and a i5 processor being common, encryption is a very good option. Once, let's say an entire volume or a hard disk has been encrypted, even if somebody tries to get access to it, they would not be able to understand the data till they crack the encryption key to decrypt that particular data. When we are transmitting data over the line, we always should be using HTTPS. The S stands for SSL or TLS, Secure Socket Layer or Transport Layer Security, which ensures that data is encrypted while it is being transmitted over the intranet or the internet. And securing your DNS servers. DNS servers are domain name servers, which are basically indexes that allow a mapping of a domain name to an IP address. For example, when we type in google.com in the address bar of a browser, the internet doesn't know what google.com is. There's a DNS server which would host an index of all the domains with their corresponding IP addresses. And it is these IP addresses that help us identify devices over the internet. So securing these DNSs is very important. For example, if, an, if a hacker is able to send a fake update to a DNS, changing the mapping of a particular domain with a particular IP address and uh, the hacker then can host a malicious server, give it a particular IP address, change the mapping on the DNS server and thus have unsuspecting users redirected to malicious websites without them even knowing what's going on. So securing DNS in today's world is very much important. Let's go through some uh, slides. Uh, Two-factor authentication adds layer of security to the authentication process by making it harder for attackers to gain access to a person's device or online accounts. As discussed, when we use online mechanisms or let's say in this example, we are making an online payment and when we are on the bank side, uh, we type in what are the payment uh, recipient is, the amount and all that data and when we click on pay, we need to authenticate that the payment has been initiated by us. And so, the bank sends a OTP or a one-time password to us for authenticating the transaction, right? Once we receive the PIN or the OTP, we type it uh, in the website, on the, on the bank's website, and then the transaction is authenticated. If the PIN or the OTP is incorrect, the transaction gets invalidated right there and then. Secure passwords. So as we have been saying, passwords need to be strong. They need to be created in a certain manner, which can be randomized. So here we are prescribing at least 15 characters. Now I understand 15 characters of passwords which are unique to each and every account. It would be very difficult to remember. However, it is the necessity of the hour. And this doesn't mean that we create very complex passwords and then write them down on a piece of paper and keep that paper in our wallet. That's defeating the purpose. So we need to train our minds and train ourselves to create more effective passwords which cannot be guessed or cannot easily be cracked. So at least 15 characters should include capital letters, should include special characters like at the rate, ampersand, hashes or percentile and should include numbers. So as we've uh, stated earlier, a password should be a randomized string of uppercase and lowercase alphabet A through Z, 0 through 9 numbers and special characters. It should be randomized in such a way that it should not be on a, a dictionary word 
should not be a variant of a particular word. For example, normally we use the word PASSW0 or WORD as password. And then to complicate a little bit, we use the variant P at the rate SSW0RD. These are still easily hackable passwords because these are commonly used by a lot of users in the world. So we have to be very careful and we have to create those passwords which are unique to us and are very difficult to crack. So for the second demo, let's go to this website, how secure my password is. And this will get you a little bit of an understanding of how, how long it would take for a computer to crack the current password that you have. And I don't suggest you actually type in your passwords, but just type in some random words to understand the complexity of a password and how more complex the password, more lengthy the password, it would be difficult for a brute force attack for a computer to conduct, right? So here we are assuming that we are doing a brute force attacks. That means that we are going to try each and every combination of the character set to crack a password and based on a regular machine, how much time is it going to take for that machine to crack a particular password? When we say a regular machine, machine that an average person can purchase in a laptop or a desktop store, right? So if I just use the word P-A-S-S-W-O-R-D, you can see that it can instantly be cracked because it's a very well-known password. If you scroll down, it will also tell you that this is a common password in the top five most used passwords. So people actually use this word password as a password. If I use a variant, let's say I do a P at the rate S-S-W-0-R-D, you will see that if even if it's a variant, it would take 19 minutes for the computer to crack this password. And if I just add a few numerics, so we have P at the rate SSW0RD. If I add one, two, three, four at the end, you can see that since the password is now lengthy enough, even if it is not complex, if, even if it is not randomized, since the length of the password is quite big now, it will still take 200 years for a regular computer to brute force this password. Even if I use random words, if the key length or the password length is weak, it's small, it's less, it would still not be sufficient enough. For example, I'm typing in generic characters B, W, P, you can see it's 400 nanoseconds, 11 microseconds, B, W, P, A, F, T, W, P. So even if I'm typing in random characters right now, all of them are lowercase and uh, they're easily guessable. So it's, it would still take five seconds for a brute, co brute force attack to work. But as I keep on typing in random characters and if I, as I increase the length of the password, you can see the number of years that it would take is increasing phenomenally. It is now 898,000 years for us to crack this password. I don't even know what I have typed so far, but since the key length is strong, the password is now efficient enough to withstand brute force attacks, right? So that's the reason why not only randomness, uh, uh, we creating a random password is important. We having number of characters in a password is also very important. So I would suggest to have at least 12 characters to 18 characters in a password for it to be effective enough against brute force and dictionary based attacks. Regular updates for all the softwares is recommended. In fact, if possible, uh, set it up for auto updates. If you're not comfortable with that because it may require restarts and uh, it may consume a lot of bandwidth in the background, especially if you're doing something that consumes bandwidth. For example, you're on a VoIP call and then suddenly something triggers an automatic update. So we don't want those scenarios to happen. So you can still keep them on a manual basis, but remember to at least check for updates once in a while maybe once or twice a week would be recommended. Uh, over a period of time, you would realize how often uh, the updates of an application are being sent and then you can customize and you can then vary your updates or uh, checking for updates uh, as per your feedback that you're getting. So you get updates because the older version was hacked or was vulnerable. Some vulnerabilities could be reported by third party users or some organizations do a vulnerability assessment and penetration test themselves over a period of time, realize there are some flaws and will create updates and send it across to mitigate vulnerabilities. Antiviruses in today's world are a must. You need to keep these antiviruses. And again, an antivirus would be the perfect example of updates being installed. Almost on a daily basis, you will find new signatures being created for new viruses and worms and mal malwares that have been found on the internet. So we, it's just not this, that we install an antivirus and we forget about it. We have to install the antivirus. We have to keep it updated. There would be updates to the core antivirus that would be released by the organization over a period of time. Not only that, your signature databases would be updated regularly, almost daily for new newly identified viruses, worms, trojans, etc. So installing an antivirus and then keeping it updated is a wanted 
task. Firewalls, as discussed earlier, is a system designed to prevent unauthorized access to or from a private network. Now, what is authorized and non-authorized is a little bit different as far as firewalls are concerned. Firewalls will not be looking at users and passwords, but they will be looking at connections. So you can configure a firewall based on IP addresses, port numbers, MAC addresses, and uh, maybe even a web application firewall with certain scripts that are allowed or disallowed. We'll be discussing firewalls in details later on in a particular video. Right now, let's just focus on having a good firewall installed and having it properly configured. And this is where the technicality comes in. So you want to allow a particular channel to, to be utilized and you want to disallow a another particular channel from being utilized you have to create the specific rules in the firewall so at the network level itself if any threat is created the firewall will try to mitigate it once and for all phishing when you get an email that looks suspicious you have or you have to no relation to with then do the following never click on that link given in the email for example you will get a lot of hyperlinks maybe you get a very genuine looking email from facebook saying there has been some unauthorized activity on your account click here to verify your account verify the authenticity of that email do not click on those links uh, check the header of the email see where the emails actually come from or the best thing is right click on that link click on copy link location and paste that hyperlink in a notepad you will get the underlying path to where that link heads to verify that the path is correct is actually owned by the organization who the email is representing if yes everything is fine if not something is wrong do not give any personal information or details if asked you will see a lot of lottery winning emails coming in asking you for personal information like date of birth uh, address phone numbers all of these are very important to keep ourselves secure on the internet as well our identities could be leaked out and somebody could then hijack our identity and uh, create havoc for us so only give out information to trusted people if you do not trust the email try to verify the authenticity if you are unable to verify the authenticity reply back with a generic questions uh, asking for further information about why you should reveal that information if it's a genuine email they would obviously respond with a favorable answer if it is a if it's not a genuine email you would not get a response do not open the attached file so if you're getting attachments from unknown recipients uh, or unknown senders and you're not you are not able to trust that email do not open the files or do not even try to download those files and try to uh, look what those files are all about it could so happen that there would be a virus worm trojan in that file and your computer could get infected and then cryptography or the encryption part that we talked about encryption is best used to protect our data the confidentiality part of it so cryptography is associated with the process of converting ordinary plain text into unintel unintelligible text and vice versa so when we want to mask data into being unreadable so if somebody hijacks that data they would still not make sense of it then use cryptography or encryption so on a regular basis your banking transactions will always be encrypted with the highest standards or standards prescribed by pci dss computer passwords they would not be encrypted per se but cryptography would be used to hash them and store a hash of the actual password in the database rather than storing the clear text and e-commerce transactions would be encrypted at any point in time Ap apart from that if you want to encrypt your own data or your own transactions or any other communications that you're making it's up to you uh, we'll deal with encryption a little bit later as well but there are a lot of options out there that will help us encrypt data so let's move on to the third demo we are going to look at encryption or we're going to look at cryptography and this is one site which allows us to look at text encryption and decryption so how does this work if I click on this link, it will take me to an application which allows me to encrypt a secret message that I can type. So I'm going to type in this is to showcase encryption. So for me to encrypt this, I'll have to provide it a password. Let's say I'm going to use ASD at the rate one, two, three, four. And I am going to utilize AES for encryption, advanced encryption standards, right? The moment I encrypt it, the data would look like this in base 64 and encrypted hex format right if i provide the password correctly over here only then will this be able to be de uh, decrypted so if i take off the password and i say decrypt you can see it says bad data it automatically populated the password itself but it says bad data if i type in the password now and if i click on decrypt 
it should be able to reverse engineer and give us the actual message right there. This is to showcase encryption, right? That's what we had typed. So without the password, if you try to decrypt that, or if it's a correct incorrect password, it's going to be gibberish for the hacker if they uh, if they're able to intercept this message. The moment you have this password and you can utilize this the message can be decrypted and be seen in clear text so th those are the basic demos for this particular topic as we go ahead we'll start building on these demos and we'll see how we can actually utilize these to launch attacks on uh, victims and how we can safeguard ourselves from these kind of attacks as well and that's it for this particular video i hope this video was informative and i thank you and appreciate your patience of going to the entire video and i'll see you in the next video thank you and bye bye Hi there, if you like this video, subscribe to the Simply Learn YouTube channel and click here to watch similar videos. To nerd up and get certified, click here.